A lot of people have asked me about battle fatigue, uh, the mental illness suffered by soldiers, particularly those who've been in war for quite some while under stressful conditions. And people have asked me, for instance, did it exist in the ancient world? Well, that's largely what this video is about. I'm not going to be using the term post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, partly because it takes too long to say, but also because I want to keep the scope of this video reasonably narrow. So I'm going to be talking just about stresses uh, experienced by soldiers in war. And so civilians having car crashes and possibly getting PTSD, that's uh, another subject. It's too big for this video. I think if I ramble for more than five hours, that would be too long. Uh, now, battle fatigue has many names. Uh, I, I've uh, read that it was called Soldier's Heart, for instance, in the American Civil War. Um, but it didn't become a, a commonly recognised thing until World War I, when it was called Shell Shock. Now, it was called Shell Shock because the, the advent of this new phenomenon that the High Command had to deal with, quite significant numbers of troops going a bit bonkers in the head, um, it was coincident with a new form of warfare, which was lots of soldiers for day after day after day standing around in trenches being shelled. So it was thought that it was perhaps the sheer concussive effect of these, these shock waves from the, the artillery pieces that were, that were sending shock waves through the soldiers' heads over and over again, and perhaps that was sending the men mad. Um, by World War II, it was pretty well firmly established that that was not actually what was happening. Uh, and even in World War II, however, the term shell shock was in the public mind. People knew about it, and so they would be using it then, but actually the people studying it had moved on already. Um, so, battle fatigue, battle stress, what, what, what causes it? And did people in the ancient world suffer from it? Were, were the Romans and, and Greeks of old coming down with it? Um, well, we don't know for certain, but there was one uh, Georgias of Leontini who was uh, writing, for instance, at the time of uh, somewhere around the Peloponnesian War, who actually he wasn't war writing specifically about combat stress, but whilst talking about something else, uh, he said the, the following. Some people in the past, when seeing fearful sights, have lost their presence of mind at that instant. Fear extinguishes and casts out the mind. Many have succumbed to groundless distress, great Sorry. malady and incurable insanity. So deeply does vision carve on the mind images of actions seen. So uh, that sounds a lot like battle fatigue, doesn't it? Um, and there's a, another example that I'll give you, which is from Herodotus, who describes at the Battle of Marathon, one of the Greek hoplites who was suddenly and unaccountably struck blind. Uh, there was no physical wound on him, and yet he was completely blind. Uh, those of you who have watched a uh, band of brothers may remember that there's a character in that who was struck with hysterical blindness. That's the term we would give it today. Uh, but that soldier, after a while, gets his sight back, whereas Herodotus tells us that the, that the man struck blind at uh, Marathon remained blind for the rest of his life. But he wasn't actually shunned by his society. He was still treated as a war hero. It was another wound. He was, he was in the glorious Battle of Marathon. He was doing his bit, and he became you know, quite a popular character. Um, so perhaps they, they didn't see it as a, a result of battle fatigue. Just a, a funny thing that happened to one guy. Um, now, uh, there is a clue that I've noticed that the ancient people perhaps were aware that traumatic experiences could lead to mental illness. And that is uh, from laws to do with the selling of slaves in the Roman Empire. Now, if I uh, have a car and I want to sell you a car and the car has been in a crash and has been repaired, at least in Britain, I have to declare that to you so that you, the potential buyer of my car, are fully informed. Uh, it's had a, you know, a, a class D prang, I would have to say, and he would then, the buyer, have to take that into account when deciding whether to buy my car or not. Well, similarly, if I was selling you a slave in the days of the Roman Empire, there are various things that I was required uh, to declare. For instance, if my female slave were pregnant, I'd have to tell you. Um, if, for instance, my slave had tried to commit suicide, that was something as well that I was obliged to tell you. So you can imagine, can't you? It makes sense. If my uh, slave has tried to commit suicide, I stopped him, he tried again, he was prevented a second time, and I think, oh, he's, one of these days he's going to succeed, he's going to kill himself, and that, then he's going to be worthless to me. It's better I sell him now, so that if he commits suicide later, well, uh, you know, buyer beware. And that, that, that you know, was no fault of mine. Well, you had to declare that he was already suicidal when you sold him, which is fair enough. And something else you had to declare was, had your slave ever been attacked by a bear or a lion? Why would you have to declare that? Well, because perhaps, I don't know this, I'm just putting my modern interpreter's brain on here, um, 
uh, spin on it. Uh, perhaps it's because they knew that if something really nasty had happened to someone, it could make them a bit mentally unstable. And so the buyer should, potential buyer, should know that. Being attacked by a wild animal, a lion or a bear. So you know, this is obviously something that wouldn't show on the man. I mean, if he had great claw marks across his chest and one missing arm, I dare say the buyer is likely to ask. But so these would presumably be slaves on whom there was no obvious sign that they'd been attacked by a lion or a bear, but you knew, so you were obliged by law to say. So that suggests that they were um, aware of this sort of general concept of, of um, mental illness caused by trauma, but notice that it's a lion or a bear, wild animals, not was attacked in the street by a load of guys. Now, a lot of slaves, of course, were taken in war. So in a lot of slaves, they were in a battle. They were, they were fighting away. Their friends were being slaughtered left and right. They were then defeated and then captured. Well, that, that's a battle and that's friends being killed. That's defeat. That's capture. That's, that's four traumatic things happened to you one after the other there. But you didn't have to declare any of those. It's as though they thought, oh, yeah, well, being attacked by a lion or a bear, that could send you mad. But battle, that's normal. And in the ancient world, it was expected of men to fight. That's one of the reasons, that's one of the things that men are for. They're, they're, they're fighting units. And if you were a Roman, in, in, the, in the days of Hannibal, for instance, in the Republic, all Roman citizens had the privilege of fighting. It, it, if you wanted to be a Roman citizen, you had to serve in the army. And therefore, serving in the army was sort of a privilege um, rather than a duty. And if you wanted to hold any significant public office, the minimum service was 10 years. And for, for most men, it was more than that. Um, so they definitely imagined it as quite normal for a man to fight in a battle. And of course, in those days, that meant with a sword, with a spear, or whatever, killing people man to man. And this was not expected to send you mad. Um, now, uh, modern studies have looked into how well troops perform over time. And um, the graph isn't perhaps quite what you imagine. So uh, at first you, you, you recruit, recruit someone and he's a bit rubbish. Oh, hang on, I should do it the other way around for you. Uh, and he's a bit rubbish. And um, then you give him basic training. So he's a bit better. And then you give him perhaps more advanced training, more specialist training, and he gets better again. And then he goes into combat. He goes into combat and he gets more and more effective. So he's getting better and better and better at being a soldier, but it's not a linear relationship. It doesn't just carry on forever. Because you know, the more experience you get, you, you, the, the more you, you become, eventually you'd be a super soldier, wouldn't you? And you'd be defeating entire armies on your own, but that, that doesn't happen. After a while, there's only so good you can get. Um, you, you will have to take risks and you know, one day that you'll wander into a bullet coming the other way and that'll be the end of you. So uh, actually it seems that you get better and better and after a while it starts to level off and then what happens then? Does it plateau? Are you then at your peak for the rest of the time? No. It levels off and then it starts going down again. And exactly how long it takes to reach that peak, um, no one can say with certainty, but the, the, the number of days of 80 days is, is reasonably commonly cited. So something like 80 days being in action, that's not being a soldier, that's being in action. For 80 days, you reach your peak and then you pass your peak and then you start to decline. Uh, how long can you be a soldier, not necessarily in action, but, but you know, towards the front being a useful, effective soldier during a, a war? Um, and remain effective. Well, according to the British after World War II, they reckoned about 400 days. After 400 days, a man was pretty much spent. You weren't going to get any more useful service out of him. The, U the United States came up with a different conclusion. They reckoned between 200 to 240 days, uh, you got useful uh, fighting life out of a soldier. And after that, he was ineffective. Um, now, exactly, I don't know what country you're from, uh, but in Britain, the normally used example is the 50th Division that fought, it, that, that, fought it, that fought in World War II. Now, in uh, 1939, this division was composed mainly of professional, full-time, highly trained soldiers. And these were in the British Expeditionary Force. They went to France. They fought in the Battle of France. They fought in the Dunkirk campaign. They were evacuated. They went back to Britain. They were retrained then to fight for, in desert warfare, and they were sent to North Africa. In North Africa, they defeated the uh, Italians and then they fought Rommel all the way across the top of, of Africa once, twice, three times. And on it went and eventually they beat him. They beat the Desert Fox and then they were sent to Sicily and they conquered Sicily. And then they were taken back to Britain 
uh, to get them ready for the Normandy landings. And it was thought that they would be superb, these soldiers. They're so experienced. These are some of our best soldiers. They've seen so much action. They're going to do brilliantly in, in, in France, uh, liberating Europe. And they went across to Normandy and they did fight in France. But they didn't perform very well. They surprised people by not actually performing all that well. And then they went into Belgium and Holland and they never made it to Germany because in December 1944 they were broken up. They were disbanded, they were no more, because they didn't want to carry on. They'd had enough. Um, they, th there are a number of reasons for this, but battle fatigue is one. They just had enough. And uh, modern armies have worked out, well indeed ancient armies have, I'm sure, have worked out how to uh, use a young man's psychology to their advantage. You see, young men anxious things they've never actually seen action and they are desperate to fit in with those around them be accepted in the group and to prove themselves to be a real man not just to their friends so that they get accepted but also to themselves and at the end of basic training no one knows how he's going to react this is something which um, is recorded in memoir after memoir after memoir and it's true that no modern army has come up with any reliable way of saying how a particular individual is going to react to the first time they go into action. Will they just be a quivering heap of terror on the ground or will they be charging at the enemy like a mad thing and perhaps getting killed? Nobody knows until that critical moment comes and young men are very very anxious about that first moment. They don't want to let their friends down, they want to be accepted by the group. Now you can appeal to that instinct as a sergeant, you could say, come on, you can make, you can, you can make, show me that you're a real man. Oh, oh, right, and he'll get up and do the thing. Or come on, you know, show me that you're brave, you've got a duty and so forth. There are all sorts of things you can yell at these young men that will motivate them to, to behave as proper soldiers. But once you've been fighting for a while, you're a bit older, you've seen it all, you've done your bit, you've nothing more to prove. You now know whether or not you're a real man. You've seen an awful lot of your friends killed. The 50th Division suffered 26,000 losses, which was very, very high. So everyone in that unit had seen close friends die. They'd had enough, they'd done their bit, it was someone else's turn. And modern warfare is very, very loud. It's very, very loud. The there, There's no way of describing to, to a, a civilian just how loud artillery shells are when they go off. They're just so phenomenally loud. It's louder than anything you've ever heard or let's hope will ever hear. And modern war involves being shelled a lot. In World War II you spent an awful lot of time being shelled and it was a constant threat. At any moment more shells might come over and a sniper could shoot you. Someone that is so far away you can't even see him but he's got a telescope on his uh, rifle and he will be able to see you and he might at any point suddenly end your life or the life of the guy who's standing right next to you reminding you that your life might end any second and it's totally out of your control there's nothing you can do to stop that bullet it arrives before you know it's even on the way in ancient warfare of course if someone twangs an arrow at you you can sidestep it or you can bring your shield up you can defend yourself in some way you're in control it's much more terrifying to be not in control if you are in a car chase and you're you're guiding the vehicle and working the pedals and the steering wheel and so forth, then you feel more in control and you feel far less stressed than your passenger sitting next to you who's just hanging on and hoping, not in control, and yet in the same amount of danger. Being in control makes you feel less stressed. Um, and there are other things which are really bad about modern warfare. So, for example, um, it goes on and on and on. In the trenches of World War one uh, in modern warfare, this constant being imperiled near the front within enemy range of some of their weapons and the enemy might suddenly appear because they're in fast vehicles perhaps, or planes flying overhead, you're in constant danger all the time and you can never completely relax. And when do you actually experience the traumatic event that possibly sends you mentally uh, deranged? Well, if you're a modern soldier, it's very likely that you are very sleep deprived when it happens. You are exhausted and an exhausted sleep deprived mind is far less uh, good at coping with traumatic experiences. Whereas in the ancient world, almost all battles were fought after a normal night's sleep and then a breakfast and then you line up with all your mates shoulder to shoulder. And there was that solidarity. You're, you're in company of people you know and trust around you and that makes you feel so much more secure and you're one of the team. But the modern battlefield's not like that. It, because 
weapons are so deadly, people have to be dispersed. There are very few of your mates around and they're not immediately next to you. Sometimes you can't get to them for some reason. And if suddenly you lose contact with your unit, that can be so much more terrifying. So the modern war is a lot more likely perhaps to cause uh, battle fatigue than an ancient war. Um, so uh, there's another thing I want to talk about, and that is taboo, upbringing. You see, the ancients revered the hero. Achilles was great. How do you know he was great? Because he was really good at killing people. Oh, he was a fantastic hero. And if you went out and, and did an awful lot of killing, well, well done you. And um, you would be applauded for that. Killing other people, assuming that they're enemies in battle, was a, was a good thing. It was a manly thing to do. But what do we say? What do, what do we say to little boys growing up now? No, 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 no! Don't stop pulling her hair. Don't do that. Put that down. No, that's dangerous. Don't stop fighting. Don't fight. Right. See me after school. Right. Okay. Right. Any more of this appalling behaviour, and you're going to go in the army. And then they go into the army, and then they uh, they're in the barrack room, and no fighting in the barrack room. Right. You extra guard duty. No fighting. Fighting is bad, and killing. Killing, it's made very, very clear to us throughout our entire lives, killing is wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. Thou shalt not kill. It's a sin. It's, it's oh, so fundamentally wrong, according to modern society. And if you look at uh, television programs, for instance, the number of who done it. I mean, you know, the, the, the classic Agatha Christie plot is a, a whole dinner party of a large number of guests, and every single one has a motive to kill whoever it is that gets killed. So surely he must have been a really bad person if everyone wants to kill him, and yet even so. You must catch the culprit and the culprit must be punished because killing is wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. And this is what we tell people right up to the moment that we say, oh, right, here, uh, Atkins, take this um, rifle and you see those people over there you've never met? Uh, go and shoot them in the face. So you're asking someone to do something that's absolutely against everything that he's been brought up to believe. You're telling people to break a taboo and do something they do not want to do. Humans do not naturally want to kill other humans. And so the stress of having to break a taboo on your own with all this loud noise when you're incredibly sleep deprived and then day after day after day after day of this is likely to drive men mad. And in fact, Unfortunately, uh, there have been enough wars where people have been in highly stressful situations in peril being shelled for day after day after day that we can actually uh, come up with the stat that after 60 days of this, 98% of people will go mad. 98% of people will be driven out, out of their heads by that. Um, and then, well, wh why, how many days does it take to get to 100? Well, we don't actually know that because after 98, all the people who are not psychopaths will have gone mad. So this is one test for, for psychopathy. If you're curious as to you know, which of your friends uh, is a psychopath, and if you know a reasonable, you know, the, the normal number of friends, some of them will be psychopaths, stick them all in the field, get them to dig uh, slit trenches and shell them for 60 days. And it's a bit harsh on the 98%, I know, but assuming they survive, the, 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 the two who are not doolally after that, they're psychos. Um, so, uh, yes, 98% of people will go mad. There is a breaking point. And during World War II, it was accepted. This had been, um, uh, at least at the, you know, the, for the people who were studying this and, and knew about it, it was near enough proven that everyone has a breaking point. Um, now, I talked about 80 days till you get to your peak and then you start to decline. Another way of putting it is there is no such thing as getting used to modern war. It's just too loud, too isolating, too terrifying, and you have to break horrible taboos that you've been brought up, and you have to do things that you've been told not to do your entire life. But in the ancient world, it was short, you generally weren't uh, sleep deprived, it was praised, it was considered normal. So, in conclusion, I would say that, yes, there probably was battle fatigue in the ancient world, but far far less of it.